and I, I gave them the link. So please take it away, Bob, and give him another warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lee. I really appreciate all you've done to bring this group together and uh, put on a great conference. Um, I feel to some degree that I am preaching to the choir here. Um, and, uh, you know, we're all in this together and uh, uh, really trying to change the world, which is, after all, what Silicon Valley is about. Not only Silicon Valley, but definitely Silicon Valley. Um, so I want to focus today on talking about some of the things that we're doing, I think, a little bit differently um, so that, uh, um, you know, be a little bit interesting. So uh, uh, my name is Bob Messerschmidt. I'm the founder and CEO of, of Core. Um, we've taken a bit of a circuitous route to where we're at, and, you know, I think that is healthy. Um, I'll also tell you I was at Apple uh, prior to starting uh, Core, and uh, I did some of the architecture of some of the sensors that you find in an Apple Watch. Um, and that was good experience. Uh, prior to that, um, I was mainly in more industrial fields, less uh, consumer-facing fields, so it was really good experience at Apple getting uh, familiar with what it takes to bring a consumer product to market. Um, so our vision and is to empower users with personalized recommendations based on vital data from blood to improve health and manage or avoid chronic illness. So uh, we've heard a few this week, uh, uh, yesterday and today uh, in this category. Uh, you know, what differentiates us most strongly uh, is that we're looking at blood. Um, uh, blood is the gold standard. Um, and um, there's a lot of information there. So what can we do to bring uh, blood testing um, to people's lives on a regular cadence so that we can build in all of these uh, mechanisms of uh, behavior modification and social support? <clears throat> so we thought the most important thing that we could do was invent some way of getting a small sample of blood in a really simple manner, something you could use in your home or, or a clinic or a doctor's office or a hospital. I'm not saying that these are exclusive from medical applications. In fact, um, some of the earliest adoption of what we're doing is almost certainly gonna be in the medical space. Um, so we wanted to come up with some way of getting a small blood sample uh, in a painless, uh, unobtrusive, and um, um, accessible fashion. So what are we looking at? Well, uh, we also have to build a spectrometer uh, to do these measurements. We've heard a bit about spectrometers this week. Um, and um, we've arrived at a platform technology that uh, uh, can measure sort of the top 10% of the menu of things that are in blood. So there's a lot of stuff in blood. Uh, other people have tried to measure all 4,000 things in a simple, seamless process. Uh, you know, we're happy with being able to measure 100 things. Um, so this is what you do. Uh, you take, hold this cartridge up against your arm, you drop it into the reader. And at that point, you walk away. There's uh, no reason to stay by the instrument. It's connected to your Wi-Fi in your home. And within a few minutes, it reports data back to your smartphone. And this can be all kinds of different data. This can be, um, you know, if you're being treated for a chronic condition, it can be medical data. And then, of course, you know, we're going through an FDA process to get those products to market. Uh, it can be more lifestyle data. Um, I like to think in terms of interventions. So for any of the chronic conditions that we might think of that are epidemic in the world, especially in the wealthy industrialized world, um, there are two steps, two layers of, of intervention. There's primary and secondary interventions. You don't want to get to the secondary ones, which are drugs and surgeries and you know, expensive, painful, debilitating things. You really want to 
you, you want to prevent, of course, but if you're, if you're in a place where you have a chronic condition, you want to, you want to resolve it with uh, the primary interventions, which tend to be lifestyle changes. And our system is not set up right now to allow us to have data at a frequent enough cadence to be able to make intelligent lifestyle changes. So that's what we're all about. <clears throat> How are we doing it? Well, so we have a reader device. This uh, is a, a small sort of clock radio sized device that sits in your home. Um, I learned a lot about industrial design at Apple, and so it's a very attractive package. Uh, but inside, it's, uh, you know, it's a 50 to 80 year old sort of uh, optical system. You know, it's, a, it's a really mature um, and therefore cost reduced sort of optical layout. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a grading spectrometer. Um, it uses a MEMS component as the light source and a MEMS component at the at this, as the detector. Very carefully chosen so that every component in the assembly is scalable because we want to make millions of these, right? We don't, we don't want to make, you know, hundreds or thousands. Um, getting the sample. So this is, this is, as I said, what I think was, was most important. And uh, uh, Ashwin has a beautiful solution to this too. Um, so the way my brain worked was um, these Lansing devices already exist. I'm not sure whether people in general are aware of Lansing devices, but here's one, right? And all you do is pull the cap off and hold it against your arm and click the trigger and you've got a microliter of blood. So, and that's all we need, right? You only need a microliter. So how can we um, uh, incorporate that into a spectrometer system? Um, well, we let the blood you know, exist right on the lancet, right on the polished tip of the lancet, and we do a reflection spectroscopy right off that surface. So essentially, uh, you've completely eliminated the need for any sort of chemistry, either dry or wet chemistry. You're just looking at a, uh, at a reagentless dried spot of whole blood uh, sitting on the tip of the thing that you use to obtain it. So really, really simple. This is the sort of data we get. We, we, it's molecular data. Uh, those of us who are molecular spectroscopists uh, uh, object to the uh, hijacking of the term molecular data by the genomics community because <laughs> they're, they're, both, they're both types of molecular information. So um, basically, this region of the spectrum, this is, this is light, but it's light that you can't see. It's infrared light. Um, and this is a region of the spectrum where particular wavelengths interact with molecular bonds and so uh, causing vibrations. So when a certain wavelength gets absorbed by a certain chemical bond in your sample, it causes that bond to vibrate in resonance. That in turn takes some energy out of the beam of light so that when your light beam then arrives at the detector, there's a dip, which if you turn it over, that becomes a peak. So uh, that's what these peaks are. These upward facing things are different molecular species within the sample. And that's important because virtually every molecular species in a sample, in this case, a drop of whole blood, has some spectral contribution in this region. So uh, it's a very rich, it's generally called the fingerprint region. Um, to mean that it, you know, it's a, uh, it's a really strong selective identifier of things in a sample. And so you can see one big band is an amide band. Proteins are particularly strong signatures in this region. Water is a particularly strong signature. That's why we look at the sample dried, actually. Um, and um, metabolites also uh, are, are strong signatures. But you have to look inside of this pattern. Um, and I know a number of people in this room are interested in AI and pattern recognition. Well, essentially what we're doing is we're zooming in inside uh, this spectral pattern the, and looking for uh, patterns that correlate to individual analytes. So 
uh, as you can see, there's, there, this, is, this is a lot like the way you would do facial recognition, right? It's the same kind of algorithms. So as you can see, there's glucose as a PC, pure component that stands for. And LDL looks very different from glucose, and fibrinogen looks very different from that, and so forth and so on. And so in this manner, you build up a library, or another way of thinking of these things as uh, weighting coefficients. So you can have a raw spectrum, and you can apply these weighting coefficients and sum them all together, and in that manner, you arrive at a concentration prediction uh, for that sample. So you can do this ad infinitum, at least down to the noise floor. So the question of how much signal to noise ratio you put in your instrument determines how deeply you can model things into the data. And of course, real world things like how much you wanna spend on a spectrometer uh, determines that. So miracle of miracles, what we discovered was when we started rank ordering things that are in blood, rank ordering them by concentration, we found that right at the top are all these things that contribute to chronic disease chronic conditions. So there's glucose, there's cholesterol, there's fibrinogen, you know, uh, inflammation markers, uh, triglycerides. And I don't think it's a coincidence. You know, I think, I think it's the sheer concentration in many cases of these things in blood that uh, makes them so bad. Uh, glucose, uh, diabetes in some sense is you know, the mechanical effects of sugar uh, in your cardiovascular system. It breaks down your capillaries after a while. And so, anyway, so we can see these top, these top level things in a very inexpensive device using mature kind of, you know, 50 year old technology. And what can you do with that? Well, as I talked about, you can give uh, numerical information. You can, you know, give red, green, blue zone information. You can also use more modern terms of data analysis to say is somebody achieving a goal. Like if, here's, a, here's a blood spectrum from an elite cyclist, and here's another blood spectrum from an elite lifter. And you know, which do you want to drive towards? You know, do you, do you want to look more like the blood sample of a lifter or a cyclist? You, know, that's, you can do these sorts of things. Um, so it needs to be accurate. You know, so sort of job one is, uh, we need to have a level of accuracy that allows us to be um, a clinically useful number. Otherwise, we're not going to talk about it. You know, this is, I think, one of the ways we're different, that everything that we're talking about is information that your doctor is already using, something that they would like to have. Um, and um, we're not only good enough, these purplish, mauve-colored uh, error bands are the limits uh, according to the Parks error grid for how inaccurate your blood glucose meter can be. And as you can see, our data is, you know, three, four times better than it needs to be. You know, it's just really, really good data in a really inexpensive instrument. So we're pretty happy with that. Uh, cholesterol, similar, triglycerides, LDL, HDL. <clears throat> So really what I want to stress is that, is that we have clinically accurate data which allows our measurements to be used in a self-test manner. If you want to track something, if you're diabetic, if you're type 1 or type 2 diabetic, or whether you have gestational diabetes. Um, and we're combining that with the desire to uh, uh, be able to track these things yourself and be more in control, because control is an important part of it being the one who's uh, making the decisions. So uh, we can give diagnostics. We can also give diet and supplement information, uh, exercise uh, uh, recommendations based on what we see in the data. And we can use our data to support evidence-based research. We think once we're, once we're launched and we have thousands of users, we think our data is gonna be better than the best data that's in the medical literature. Uh, heart disease is a huge problem. We're talking about saving the healthcare system trillions. Here's another beauty shot of our device. Uh, a bit gratuitous, sorry about that. Um, I wanted to talk about our, some of our team, but you can go to our website and see them because I'm running out of time. Uh, we do have strong medical advisors, which we think is really important. I'm not an MD. 
Uh, we have a great board. We have Bob Bozeman, who uh, I thought since I'm in Mountain View, I should say that Bob Bozeman put the first money in Google, uh, the first professional money in Google, uh, and then uh, uh, syndicated it to Kleiner Perkins and Sequoia. So he knows a good thing when he sees it. Um, and uh, you guys can help if you're interested in what we're doing. You know, we're looking for team, uh, we're looking for funding, and we're looking for partnerships. So thank you very much. Time for one short question. Uh, short, please, Rian. <laughs> uh, very intrigued by the technology, and I just wanted to ask from a biochemistry point of view, in the, the drying process, I mean, there's a lot of things that, that change in that process. Your coagulation factors will change the surface areas, yep. the, the uh, uh, angle of inception of, of the light, those type of things. The, the molecular concentrations will affect each other in that drying process, how they aggregate and associate with each other. That predicted versus actual plots that you show, is that for in blood or is that pure samples, number one? And how far are you from showing this in blood samples, if not pure sample? Because it's already very compelling what I see, but yeah, yeah. It, th there is some practicalities that I just want to know. How far are you off to, to solve those things? This is real blood. Um, this is real subjects. This was a, uh, you know, a, a formal clinical trial. Um, with IRB approved clinical trial. Uh, we enrolled 11 subjects for it. And so uh, the data is real. Uh, that was the question you ask is one of the very first questions we had was, you know, can we dry this sample? Because there are a lot of reasons spectroscopically to want to be able to do that. We found a lot of literature support for saying that we probably could, but we did, that was one of the first things we tested. And the information about um, the concentrations that we're measuring, um, we're still able to model. In fact, we're able to model them much better in the dried state than we were in the wet state. Good question. Thank you, Bob. Okay. Thank you, Lee.